Roy Bahat is the head of Bloomberg Beta, which is a venture fund backed by Bloomberg LP that invests in early state companies and startups creating the future of work. He has $150 million under management at the moment. Roy Bahat was recently a guest of our monthly Global Salon, and these are some of his answers to our questions. Roy, what are the biggest mistakes you see with respect of artificial intelligence? And when I say mistakes, it's also misconceptions. So first of all, I think that um, I want to be precise about what I'm talking about. Um, there are you know, companies that seek to invest in the sense of corporate investments in um, AI companies. Um, and there are companies that seek to invest in the sense of being customers for various vendors or hiring talent. Um, and the dilemmas are very different. I would say in general, the biggest mistake is assuming that this is like, you know, uh, white lab coat science from the future and you need scientists in order to explain it to you. The vast majority of corporations don't really need a dedicated AI team um, because the nature of the problems they want to solve should be able to be solved by relatively straightforward techniques or otherwise not at all. So I'd say the biggest mistake is blowing lots of money on a sci-fi vision of the future when really what you need is more meat and potatoes AI, as one of my partners says. And let me explain what that is. Pretty much every company has a data science group of some kind. Well, the reality is, and for those of you who've done any economics or math, you know, you know the main tool for a data scientist is often a simple regression analysis that you know, draws a line through some dots. The, you know, most of what we call AI in the enterprise is not much more sophisticated than that. And because um, it's easier to take a separate project and wall it off and give it some money and point at it and say it's high profile, um, because it's easier to do that than it is to make the real kinds of changes that technology requires, which I'll talk about in a minute, companies tend to do that. They blow a lot of money the CEOs and financial leadership have what I call the cardiologist problem, which is, you know, they've been told they should go to the cardiologist. They go to the cardiologist and the cardiologist tells them they need open heart surgery. And then they're like, okay, well, what do I do? I guess maybe I get a second opinion, but it's just another cardiologist. And so and then they don't know what to do. So the single biggest risk to corporations from AI in the short term is not the misuse of technology, although that's a risk and dot, dot, dot. It's really blowing lots of money on foolish dreams that don't make sense. And, you know, the thing I would ask before any company embarks on any advanced AI project, and I'll give examples of some of the things that I think work in just a moment. Um, but the thing that I would ask is, what have you used data in order to enable in your business recently? Like if your internal corporate databases are not organized enough for you to do basic data analysis, then the chance you'll be able to do any AI is roughly zero. And so the kinds of things that I do think uh, can matter enormously um, are number one, um, and they're not very sexy to talk about, so, but you know, nonetheless, I'll, I'll mention them. Number one is a general culture, and I'm just going into my home right now, so if you get a little outdoor noise, I apologize. But number one is just a general culture inside the corporation of the use of more software. And this is one of the places where I believe that the pandemic has actually been most helpful um, in the sense that, uh, you know, it used to be that a typical corporate employee would use, you know, I don't know, zero, one, two, maybe pieces of new software uh, per year in the context of doing their job. And in the post pandemic era, as everybody went home out of necessity for industries where everybody went home out of necessity, all of a sudden people are using all these new tools and they're getting in the settings and they're messing around and they're learning how it works. That probably matters. That familiarity probably matters a lot more to um, the use of um, advanced technology than any white lab coat project. So that's um, one thing. A second thing is finding vendors that are in areas that are, um, that are 
uh, what's the right way to put it, um, that are going to yield immediate results that may use AI. And I'll give two examples of ones that I think are extremely promising, one in which we're not investors um, and one in which we are investors. And I always try to acknowledge our self-interest so that I'm not using a conversation like this to, uh, you know, to promote my book. Um, one in which we're in the main not investors, we have a couple little things, is um, RPA, robotic process automation, which is effectively you know, using automation in order to um, replace repetitive manual work. And um, the, uh, and I'm gonna be on video in just a second, guys. Uh, the, uh, the feeling that I have about um, RPA is that many, many organizations, if not every large corporation would benefit from it. Um, a second example is the use of AI for expense auditing. Um, and so we invested in a company called AppZen that is um, using artificial intelligence to say, okay, it looks like this person's expense reports seem to raise issues about FCPA, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act adherence, or um, you know, it seems like they've been uh, you know, several times um, you know, close to breaking the expense rules, and that is associated with somebody who is likely to be a, uh, you know, a repeat risk for breaking expenses. So those are two examples of vendors, but really spending money on advanced technology is generally the sin. Um, you want to start basic and, you know, it really is a walk before you run kind of an environment. How do you educate decision makers in finance about artificial intelligence, new technologies and the future of work? Is there resistance there? Well, you know, it's a great question. I think that it might start with um, them remaking their own functions. And, um, you know, of course, as you know, there are, people in every uh, corporate function who primarily exist in a place of avoiding being fired. And um, those people I think are going to suffer a lot in the AI era because the pressure on them to reinvent or leave is going to continue rising. It can work for a long time to be the guardian of conservatism inside a company. But eventually the music stops and um, my guess is your readers are more the types because they're you know, trying to educate themselves who are trying to understand the future. And I would just say the best way to get familiar is to start it within your own function. And um, that could mean uh, you know, there's plenty of, depending what industry they're in, revenue prediction and forecasting tools. I already mentioned expense auditing. Um, and that way they can become, I think, um, experts in the organization internalize some of the benefits. And then what really I think many people in senior finance leadership roles often want and struggle to do is a seat at the table on broader business decisions. And if they develop this expertise, which otherwise would be developed by the CMO or by the head of sales or some other function, I think they could really be um, the strategic executives that companies need for the future. And I'll just say one last thing the pandemic has created moments where the old barriers to the old procedures that blocked innovation inside corporations are now, those barriers are weakened. You know, I have a friend who is a doctor and for years she's been trying to get her hospital, she's a research doctor, to allow her to approve um, research funding using DocuSign. But there was some reason, you know, the CIO always has a reason and then guess what? You do the pandemic, five, min five minutes later, she's signing on DocuSign. And so to the extent a blocker to change has been corporate procedure, this is a moment in which we can, re, you know, we can, we can uh, interrogate all of that. What about the soft side of skills require at this moment? One of the reasons I skipped over talking about it is that I actually think there's no such thing as soft skills anymore. Um, the ability to know how to manage someone so that they feel fulfilled and perform, how to create a diverse and inclusive team, how to um, uh, build a work environment where people contribute their best ideas. You know, this is, these are um, 
survival skills in modern business. So I don't think there's anything particularly, um, I think traditionally they were seen as less important. Um, and I think that that's now ending. Um, and uh, I guess I just say that those skills have been traditionally seen as the provenance of only certain functions. You know, it's okay for the CFO to be tough as long as the head of HR is humane. You know, those kinds of stereotypes. And I think that this moment is an opportunity to re-examine all of that. You know, the most humane CFO who creates a culture of inclusivity is going to outperform. And that wasn't always true in many industries. It, it just wasn't always true. And now I think it's becoming more true. What is the pandemic and what is the recession doing to the sector? What are the effects on the sector, on this kind of investments, on this kind of innovation and companies? You know, I'll start with the obvious, which is this is an economic crisis unlike any that I've seen in my life, which is to say it's both a supply shock and a demand shock at the same time. It's got both technical and fundamental aspects and the, the risk of hysteresis or however you pronounce it, um, of the, the, you know, the inability to restart certain parts of the economy that have stopped, we just, none of us know quite what to expect yet, even as the data unfold. Um, and so I am setting aside, I guess I'd say the questions of existential strategy that face many businesses because it's so specific to the industry that they're in. I mean, in addition to being a global downturn, I feel like we have this like jagged graphic equalizer where some settings have gone way up and some have gone way down and it's dizzying. You know, uh, in the US, I call this the King Arthur flower effect. I mean, I challenge anybody to show me the person who said, when we have a pandemic, one of the businesses that will most benefit is the flour and baking business. I mean, who knew? Um, there's just these unexpected consequences. That said, I think to the extent there's a general lesson, I'd say I think there are two, one that is um, technology related and the other that isn't. The technology related one is downturns all, always bring acceleration in the adoption of technology. In this case, we both have it because there's a desire to be more efficient. Um, and in many cases on the supply side, because we literally can't have people doing some of the same jobs. And so, you know, I'll give you two examples of robotics companies that we're involved with, so I'm biased, but we got involved in part because we thought they had these advantages. One is called Ware, W-A-R-E, and it's a drone that does inventory calculations in warehouses, automated warehouse inventory calculations. Well, a lot safer to have a drone flying around than another person in the facility. The second is an office security robot. Um, called Cobalt, and that security robot was intended initially to be an inexpensive addition to offices in places where it didn't make sense to have a human guard, for example, at night patrolling the office. And now it turns out that that robot can play a role in creating a safer office, a more hygienic office, and does not have to expose another person. So I think that that's the technology thing is there's a sort of a seize the moment side of it. The, um, the, the culture of business side of it is these are the moments where the values are forged. Whatever companies say about values in easier times matters a tiny amount, infinitesimally compared to what they do in this moment. And so for all of the companies that say they want to fight racism or sexism or take care of their people, this is their chance to show it with actions that may be costly financially. And I think that um, employees and customers will remember. Um, I think, uh, you know, that that's obviously remains to be seen. Roy, what is the geography of all these developments? In other words, not all regions are moving at the same speed. Innovation is not happening at the same speed everywhere and it's not the 11 playing field. So what in terms of research, what in terms of exchanges and tensions? I agree. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that every era presents an opportunity for nation states to compete. And if you ask me the dimension of competition, I think that um, there are several that are more important now than they were before. One is, um, is certainly investment in technology. And in some countries, the government is just the largest corporation. And so they may be the best one at using new technologies. Um, certainly the history across the world of new innovations starting in the military is a really long one. I mean, the internet started with the military, you know? Um, uh, so I think that that for sure will be true. I think that we are seeing, so that uh, the, the, the big country dimension of that is investment in R&D. I think there is an R&D war on where what's at stake is which countries are thriving 50 years from now. And I think the U.S. is losing that war right now. We're losing it because of immigration policy. We're losing it because of a declining share of federal government spending going into scientific research. And I think China is winning that war right now. Um, and they're winning it uh, also because of their liberal use of data, which may be inappropriate in our cultural context. And that's something that we also need to examine. So there's this whole scientific R&D use of technology cluster. Um, and the winning country, I think, will be the one that develops. Well, let me get to that in a second. The second dimension is quality of life. Quality of life is just so much more of a factor, I think, than it was as more and more people join a global middle class that can be mobile. And so if it turns out it's a great place to live in Portugal, um, if it turns out Canada is a less racist country than the US, I think that will drive meaningful economic flows in terms of the justice of how citizens are treated and healthcare and all these different measures of quality of life, political freedoms, et cetera. And the winning country to me will be the one that can integrate these two things. How do you have a modern quality of life, which I think is, um, is, is in the process, we're in the process of defining it, including freedoms, which I think are important, with a culture of the embrace of te modern technology. And I think China is doing well on one and poorly on another. The US is doing at the moment, I think not so well on both. And it's, um, it's up for grabs.